introduce our panel. Uh, David Beckworth is an assistant professor of economics at Western Kentucky University and a former international economist at the U U.S. Department of Treasury and assistant professor of economics at Texas State. He's done research on the measurement of monetary policy, the transmission mechanisms through which it works, and its impact on global, national, and regional economies. And Scott Summer, sitting next to him, uh, is a professor of economics at Bentley University, has taught economics at Bentley University for the past 30 years, and earned a BA in economics at Wisconsin and a PhD over at Chicago. His research has been in the field of, again, monetary economics, particularly the role uh, that the gold standard play in, played in the Great Depression. And he's also done research on forward-looking monetary policies. So um, join me in welcoming our, our panel, and we'll, we'll dig right into it with uh, Dr. McCree. The role of moderators has uh, been very much in the public view uh, during the presidential debates. And I'm a moderator today, but I don't think this is going to be a debate because our two panelists have similar and complementary views on the issues that we'll be discussing today. I've always considered myself to be a Milton Friedman monetarist, which emphasizes the role of money growth in monetary policy rather than interest rates. And as I understand it, our, our panelists are monetarists as well, but they've taken it a couple of steps further. They're leaders in a new school of thought called market monetarism, and they both advocate nominal GDP targeting as the best way for the Fed to go. Now, monetarism works well when the velocity of money doesn't change or when its changes are small or predictable. Market monetarism, as advocated by our panelists, uses market signals to help anticipate changes in the velocity of money, and they recommend nominal GDP target as a means of moderating velocity changes. Now, if I got that wrong, I'm sure they'll let me know in just a couple of minutes. But first, I wanted to set the stage with a brief summary of recent monetary policy, just to get everybody uh, starting at the same place. As the looming financial crisis became more apparent in late 2007, the Fed began an aggressive easing of monetary policy in conventional terms. That is, they reduced the target federal funds rate. And by the end of 2008, the federal funds rate had fallen to near zero and short-term market rates declined along with it. Also during 2008 and 2009, the Fed established several novel lending programs to encourage banks to borrow and, enga and engaged in asset purchasing programs to unfreeze frozen financial markets. This first conventional and then unconventional easing of monetary policy produced a sharp increase in the Fed's balance sheet. The increase in the Fed's assets was roughly matched by an increase in the reserve deposits of banks, which show up on the liability side of the Fed's balance sheet. Once short-term interest rates got about as low as they could go, the Fed continued open market purchases, which were labeled not by the Fed but by others quantitative easing as opposed to interest rate easing. The quantitative easing program lasted through March of 2010 and was later dubbed QE1, or quantitative easing number one. The economy weakened following the end of QE1, so on November the 3rd, 2010, the Fed embarked on a new so-called quantitative easing program to purchase an additional $600 billion worth of Treasury securities. This second round of easing lasted through June of 2011, and was dubbed QE2. The, conveds, the Fed's conventional easing, plus its asset purchases during QE1 and 2, increased its total assets and liabilities by roughly $2 trillion. Its assets went from about $800 billion prior to the financial crisis to about $2.8 trillion uh, by the middle of 2000, uh, 2011, where they have remained since. Contrary to what you, the impression you may have, there has been no net expansion of Fed uh, assets since the middle of 2011. The economy weakened again in mid-2011, so in November, in an effort to put downward pressure on longer-term interest rates, including mortgage rates, the Fed announced a maturity extension program. The Fed would buy longer-term treasuries and sell an equal amount of short-term treasuries. 
This program was called Operation Twist. Operation Twist, as opposed to the earlier programs, did not increase the Fed's assets or liabilities since their, their purchases were offset by sales of something else. It was extended last month and is scheduled to expire at year end, but we may learn tomorrow that the Fed wants to allow that to expire or to extend it. During 2012, as the weak recovery became even weaker, the Fed's FOMC announced at its September meeting a new easing program, naturally called QE3 by others. It would buy $40 billion worth of mortgage-backed securities per month until the unemployment rate improves significantly. This latest program is open-ended rather than having a fixed time period or a fixed dollar amount of asset purchases. The rationale for QE3 now is that Congress had given the Fed a dual mandate of low inflation and low unemployment. Inflation was pretty tame, close to the Fed's new target of 2%, but the unemployment rate had been stuck above 8% for a long time. I know from personal experience that the FOMC is very reluctant to do any major monetary policy changes during election season, so they obviously felt that their mandate from Congress combined with the further weakening of the economy required it. The, whole, the holdings of large amounts of excess reserves by the banking system, rather than the banks using all of them to create new loans and investments and thus create new spendable money, uh, blunted the impact of the Fed's actions. In effect, the banking system sterilized a lot of the Fed's open market purchases. They may have been necessary to, uh, to prevent a double debt recession, meaning the Fed's purchases, but they obviously have not been sufficient to bring recovery up to desired levels. Now, by the same token, the critics' charges of massive money creation or money printing, which will lead to hyperinflation and a collapse of the dollar, are misplaced, in my opinion. If you watch CNBC and Bloomberg, virtually every guest on there talks about the Fed's massive money printing and how that's going to lead to massive inflation and a collapse of the dollar. That is not likely to happen, in my opinion, because those uh, purchases have created bank reserves, which were still on the books of the balance sheet. Or you can go to the money supply and see how it's been behaving. In the last couple of years, the M2 measure of the money supply has grown from 6 to 7 percent. And if you look to the dollar, the various indexes of the uh, trade-weighted average of the dollar, it is about where it was prior to the financial crisis. It went up a good bit early in the crisis due to safe haven considerations, and it's been coming down, but it's right now about where it started before the crisis. Now, I'm eager to find uh, if our panelists agree with what I've just said and to hear their recommendations for improving Fed policy and the results of Fed policy. And I hope they keep in mind that I retired from the Fed in November of 2004, so any mistakes that may have made since then are not my fault. <laughs> so let's start with David first. What is nominal GDP targeting, David? Well, let me answer that by going back to a, a point you just made, and you can see on the picture on the screen here, there's this common view that the Fed has just been incredibly easy. It's been dropping money in the economy. In fact, there's many observers who talk about the helicopter with Ben Bernanke driving it and dropping lots of money. So this picture here kind of captures this notion that the Fed has been incredibly easy. What Scott and I would, would, would suggest is to take a more nuanced approach in understanding what the Fed has done. On one hand, when you have you know, the printing press going and the Fed creating money, an increase in the money supply, that does tend to encourage spending. Um, but you can also have an increase in money demand. And that's the tendency for households, for firms to want to increase their holding of money. And when they do that, that will actually discourage spending. So you can have a huge increase in the stock of money and have no effect on inflation, on spending, if it's being hoarded or held by households. So Bob mentioned that approximately $2 trillion of Fed money, a very narrow measure of money, which is currency in circulation plus bank reserves, has occurred over the past few years. 
Well, that, that same amount has almost been matched by an increase in bank holdings. So you can think of it as the Fed's increased its supply of money and the demand for it has gone up proportionally by the banks. Um, you call that increase in demand a reduction in velocity. If you yes, yes. Yeah. So what you called velocity would be the same thing as an increase um, in demand for money or decrease in velocity, increase in demand for money. Uh, I would also know when we talk about the money supply, um, we've been talking about the Fed's money, but there's other forms of money as well. All financial firms or many financial firms make money as well. Your deposit, that's a financial firm's liability. That, that becomes money as well. And if we look at money more broadly speaking, um, as Bob mentioned, it hasn't grown dramatically and the demand for it has actually increased as well. So when we think about the effect of monetary policy, what we want people to do is to realize there's both the demand for money and the supply of it. And you could create an infinite amount of money, and if the demand for it is just as big, it's not going to have an effect. Um, so look, to answer your question, what is nominal GDP targeting, let me first answer what is nominal GDP. Because most of us are familiar with real GDP, but nominal GDP can be thought of as total current dollar spending. So if we were to go out and, and take a look, maybe from 30,000 feet down, and, and, and measure how much money is being spent on the US economy, we'd call that nominal GDP, or total current dollar spending. And that's equal to the total amount of money on one hand, and then how often it's being used. So there's a, there's a stash of money, and then there's the you know, tendency to use it. How often will we use that money? Again, that's money demand. And so you could have a huge stash of money, and if it's not being used, total current dollar spending may not be that high. In fact, it could actually fall. You could increase the money supply and see a drop in spending if the demand for money goes up even more. Um, a final way to think about this, and just to throw an equation up there you probably saw in college, is something called the equation of exchange. And that, that M there stands for the money supply. V is velocity. So money supply times velocity, or money supply times money demand, should be equal to nominal GDP, which is equivalent to P, the price level, times real GDP, or the, the dollars spent on the goods and services produced in the economy. And what we're suggesting with nominal GDP targeting is the Fed should try to stabilize that M times V, or money supply times money demand. And we'll talk more about how they would exactly do that a little bit later. But our, our belief is that if the Fed did this, it would solve a lot of problems and would, we would see a robust recovery going forward. Now, how would it work in practice? So on the, this next uh, figure, you see a, a chart that shows total current dollar spending over time. So imagine the Fed is <clears throat> excuse me, targeting nominal GDP, and it's growing at a steady pace. Then all of a sudden, a boom occurs. So all of a sudden, um, total current dollar spending grows too fast. Maybe people have seen lower lending standards or people get your, your fork and they spend more than they normally do. Well, that kind of boom would be destabilizing, leads to asset price bubbles and, and, and other behavior you might not like. So the Fed would say, no, we're not going to allow that to happen. We're not going to allow it to be a permanent increase in the level of spending. We're going to step in and we're going to bring it back down the path. And so we would put it on the, on the red line on the figure would, would be the level target. So one thing that we're advocating is a level target. We're going through time, nominal GDP misses its target, the Fed has to make up for it in a subsequent period. It can't let bygones be bygones. It has to make up for past mistakes, both good and uh, above and below the path. So with that said, this next figure illustrates more uh, in a, a development more like what we've seen recently. We're going through time, spending's traveling along, and then all of a sudden we have a, a drop or a bust in spending. And if you let that persist, it would look something like this. And, and, and this is destabilizing for a number of reasons. Let me just point out one now. If you've been traveling through time, like we have 25 years or so prior to the Great Recession, we grew about 5% nominal GDP did. And, and when you have stable nominal GDP growth, it creates stable uh, nominal income growth, which is the same thing as saying stable current income growth. So imagine you're traveling through time, 25 years, you've had stable current income growth on average, and you're going to take out a 30-year mortgage. Well, you're probably going to base your forecast of what your income growth will be over the next 30 years based on what they were the previous 25 years. It's a good you know, rule of thumb. So people take out these long-term mortgages, these long-term fixed debt contracts, and all of a sudden they hit a bust. 
suddenly they don't have the income they once thought they had, and suddenly that debt burden goes up. And that's one way to look at the current crisis. We had a 25-year runs called the Great Moderation. Things went really well. And then we had this sudden, unexpected drop in current income growth. Um, the Fed's job and under a nominal GDP target would be to correct that. The red line would show where we would, where nominal GDP would put it back on target. Okay, so with that said, what actually has happened? So this next chart shows uh, the actual path of nominal GDP. And again, uh, th this starts in 95, but this is based off of a trend, off of a history going back to the early 80s. The black line shows actual t dollar amounts of spending in the US. Um, the blue line you see shows a trend based off of the 80, 1983 to 2007 period. Um, and that red line shows the Congressional Budget Office's estimate of where nominal GDP should be uh, today. So the trend in, in, the, in the CBO's estimate is slightly different, but they both show a big uh, gaping hole between where nominal GDP is and where it should be. Uh, so you can see around mid-2008, suddenly there's a huge drop in the level of total current dollar spending. And that was triggered by the financial crisis, right? It, it was, Three. yeah, it was triggered. We can get into the cause and effects here. Um, it, I don't know, if Scott, if you want to chime in now and respond yeah, to that. it actually works both ways, because the, the big decline in nominal GDP was basically, well, thank you, between June and December of 2008, uh, Lehman Brothers failed roughly halfway through that period, and the worst part of the crisis followed Lehman Brothers failing. So a lot of us think that the causality actually went two ways. Uh, we all know about how the financial crisis contributed to the recession, but a lot of market monitors think that the big fall in nominal GDP between June and December 2008 really intensified the financial crisis. And that's why the estimates of financial losses were much, much larger at the end of that drop in nominal GDP than, say, in mid-2008, even though in mid-2008 we already knew about the subprime problems, but that big drop in nominal GDP made the debt crisis spread much deeper in the economy. Just a few more things. So again, we know that nominal GDP is, is a product of the money supply and, and the demand for money or velocity. So what actually happened to money? Um, here's a graph that shows two measures of money, M2 and M4. And don't worry about the divisio. The divisio is just a, a way of indexing money, um, so it's, it's scaled appropriately. but. Uh, M2 measure, which Bob talked about earlier, has grown and been relatively stable. But M4 is a measure of money that's broader than just M2. M2 measures what I would call retail money assets, assets that we use as money, checking account, currency, money market mutual funds. But there's also institutional investors who need money, pension funds, life insurance companies, big mutual funds. And the assets they use as money is, is broader than what we do, and, and that broader measure of money, M4, shows a sharp decline about the time nominal GDP goes down. So we have both, well, in this picture, we see a decline in the stock of money. And I'm also going to show you this next slide, which suggests that the demand for money also went up, at least from the household's perspective. In this figure here, there's a couple of lines we've got to um, assess. The blue line shows the share of households' assets that are liquid. So think of the assets that you, you own as an individual and what percent of those are liquid. There would be money, again, checking accounts, your, if you own some treasuries, but highly liquid assets that you would turn to in times of uncertainty. So if you don't know what's gonna happen in the future, if you don't know if you're gonna hold your job, you would go and, and hold on to highly liquid assets. There'd be a shift into that. And, and this shows them as a percent of the total household budget. So during the last two recessions, the gray bars there, you see that they uh, increase the share of household assets that are liquid, the share of money-like assets that households are holding, they, it surges during the recessions. And along with that goes the unemployment rate. Um, and this doesn't prove causality, but it, it does suggest that when people are uncertain, their demand for money and money-like assets increase. And so we both had a decline in, in terms of money and broadly measured as well as an increase in the demand for it. And the two kind of fed into each other as well. So we, we've had um, a decline in nominal GDP. Um, I, I would also mention, you know, based on the previous slide in this one, you can see that the share of liquid assets held by households is still elevated. They're still holding an inordinately high amount of liquid assets, which, which means you know, they're still uncertain about the future. There's still something that's preventing them from moving out of liquid assets into riskier, higher yielding ones. 
Uh, and, and similarly, the money supply hasn't grown as, as rapidly in terms of broad money as we've seen before. So that's kind of a summary of what is nominal GDP and what's ha happened to it over the past few years. I find it interesting that I think of nominal GDP on, as the right-hand side of that equation of exchange, prices times real uh, output. But you're sort of focused on the, uh, on the left side of it, which I guess focuses on what causes the spending. Right, the, the, the money side of it. So. Yeah. Scott, do you want to pick up here some? Okay, yeah, I'll, I'll talk about um, some of the issues that I've heard raised over the years, and, and feel free to, you know, interrupt me with questions. I'd be glad to address any. Um, let's just think about what nominal GDP targeting might be like. Um, it, we've averaged about 3% real growth over the last, say, 100 years. And basically, the optimists think we're going to keep growing at about 3%, and the pessimists think we're only going to grow about 2% going forward because of various problems with our economy. So that's sort of the range of estimates you get, 2 to 3% real growth. Now, nominal GDP growth is uh, inflation rate plus the real growth rate. So during the great moderation, we had about 2% inflation, about 3% real growth for a total of 5 Okay. And basically, in the long run, all the Fed can do is control that total, the sum. It can't control the breakdown between those two components. So the Fed could have the economy grow at 5%, but the amount of real growth you get depends on technology and all that other stuff. So one way to think about it is if we're going to grow somewhere around 2 to 3% real terms over the next few decades, you could set a nominal GDP target, say, at 4.5%. And basically, that's going to get you somewhere between one and a half and two and a half percent inflation long term. We don't know exactly, but something in the ballpark of one and a half to two and a half percent, which is close to the inflation rate we had in the Great Moderation. Now, the reason I raise this is a lot of people, I think, are a little bit frightened of the fact that if we move to nominal GDP targeting, we're moving away from what we've been doing, which has been sort of a flexible inflation target. And so a lot of the questions I get are, well, what happens to inflation then? if we move in this direction. Couldn't inflation go crazy up or down? And of course, anything is technically possible, but when you start to think about what's plausible in terms of long-term real growth rates for the economy, it's really very unlikely that inflation long-term would average much different than around 2%, a little bit above or below. Then the second question is, well, what if there's short-term fluctuations? Couldn't you have a year where you had zero real growth and four and a half or five percent inflation? Yes, you could, but then you have to think about why is that happening? That kind of outcome, which could occur under any sort of targeting regime, would reflect a really negative supply shock hitting the economy if you had no real growth and pretty high inflation. And the fact of the matter is monetary policy just can't do much about supply shocks. So Americans are going to take a hit to their living standards, whether you do inflation targeting or nominal GDP targeting when there's a supply shock. But in fact, it's even worse because if you do inflation targeting during a supply shock, the hit to living standards will actually be greater for sort of subtle reasons. And here's why. If you had, say, 2% inflation targeting and a real negative supply shock, uh, you'd have to really lower the growth rate of nominal GDP, maybe down to around 2% or something like that. And that slow growth in nominal GDP would create a lot of unemployment, more unemployment during the supply shock than you get with nominal GDP targeting, which is sort of more flexible. And so what would happen, is, in addition to suffering from whatever the direct supply shock was like, a cutoff of oil or something, you'd have the secondary effect of high unemployment under inflation targeting. With nominal GDP targeting, you've got a sort of a shock absorber. And what happens is during bad times when um, real growth is slow, you allow a little more inflation, and that sort of helps uh, equilibrate the labor market. It prevents a big surge in unemployment. And then when things are really good in the economy, when you have a boom do, driven by, say, technology, like in the late 90s, you actually drive inflation lower than it would normally be. 
And what that does is it tends to reduce the amount of bubbles or excesses you get during the boom periods. So it's sort of a more counter-cyclical policy than inflation targeting. You, you, you slow down the booms a little and you raise the economy a little bit in recessions. But you still keep that long-run inflation rate pretty close to 2%, which is arguably what matters. And when people think about the costs of inflation and why it's a problem, a lot of economists would argue that people are thinking about that in the wrong way. You know, the average person thinks about inflation in terms of their own pocketbook and how it affects their living standards. But in the long run, monetary policy can't affect our rate of growth and standard of living. So economists see inflation as a problem that is sort of destabilizing for the economy, potentially destabilizing. And we would argue that the benefits you get from stabilizing inflation, which are real, would be even greater from stabilizing nominal GDP. That is, many of the problems that we associate with inflation instability are actually better measured by nominal GDP instability. Could you uh, translate that language into <coughs> inflation's not so bad, but unexpected inflation is, is what is bad? That's right. You can sort of learn to live with any uh, particular inflation rate, but... Um, even there, I would qualify it a little bit. When people talk about unexpected inflation or deflation being bad, they're usually talking about it when it's from what's called the demand side of the economy. So this destabilizes the economy. If we have a surge of spending and higher inflation, we have a temporary boom and a relapse afterwards. If we have deflation, we, we tend to have unemployment because wages are sticky downward and so on. But actually, those problems of excessive boom or excessive unemployment are more closely correlated with nominal GDP growth than the rate of inflation itself. So it's more the unexpected nominal GDP growth up or down that creates this cyclical uncertainty and also arguably the unfairness between lenders and borrowers. And I don't know if we'll have time to get into that, but there's a lot of um, arguments. Uh, by the way, I have a paper coming out just today published by the Mercatus Institute that has the whole sort of case for nominal GDP targeting, if anyone's interested. Um, but um, a, few a few other problems I'll just briefly mention uh, about inflation targeting and see if there's any questions. It turns out to be really tricky, uh, the question of how do you define inflation, how do you measure it, and which one is appropriate. Here, here's one example. Uh, over the last, um, say, six years since the housing bubble peaked in 2006, the U.S. government shows housing costs rising about 10% total over that six-year period, 10% up. The Case-Shiller Index of house prices is down 35% over that period. That's a huge discrepancy. That's a 45 dis percent discrepancy in two different ways you could measure housing costs. And housing is like almost 40% of the core CPI. It's a huge part of the CPI. So we would get radically different inflation numbers if we put in the price of houses rather than the one that actually is used, which is called the rental equivalent. Um, now, I'm not going to argue that what the um, Bureau of Labor Statistics is doing is wrong necessarily, but it may not be right for the purpose of monetary policy. In other words, it might be a good way of measuring the cost of living for the average American that doesn't buy a house that year. But if you're thinking about stability in the economy, you can argue that that 35% reduction in house prices is actually more representative of what was going on in the housing industry and why housing construction really fell sharply. They weren't able to sell houses at the same price. And so if we had uh, nominal GDP targeting, we'd actually be targeting a variable that in some ways is more sensitive to actual economic conditions than the various price indices that we tend to use. And so you have to think about the fact that inflation can be measured in many ways, and the way we tend to measure it may not be the right way for monetary policy. Um, another point I like to emphasize, that I think it would Excuse help. Excuse me, do you have a favored way to, to measure inflation that would go along with, with what you're proposing, or is that yet to be invented? Well, uh, I would say if, we're, if we insist on doing inflation rather than nominal GDP targeting, I'd probably prefer something like the GDP deflator, 
that would include the price of new houses that are constructed during a given year. So it would pick up more of the actual economic conditions in the country. Well, if you're doing nominal targeting, you are using the GDP deflator, right? As part of it, but you're using also the real growth. That's right. But if you just were going to do only inflation targeting, I would move away from the CPI. I think um, uh, Bernanke's favorite and Greenspan's favorite was uh, personal consumption expenditure uh, thing. I don't. That's a little better. One yeah. of the reasons they offer is that it reduces that distortion of housing. Probably not enough, but mm -hmm. some. Yeah, that's right. Um, it also would help bring clarity to the uh, debate over stimulus. Um, we have this strange debate where the discussion of monetary policy is framed in terms of inflation, and the discussion of fiscal policy is framed in terms of real growth. Now, actually, there's nothing in economics that would suggest that dichotomy is appropriate. That is, economists view both fiscal and monetary stimulus as affecting what we call aggregate demand, total spending in the economy. And how that breaks down into inflation and real growth depends on the supply side of the economy that neither fiscal or monetary policy directly affect. So when there's a strange debate, like in Britain over the last few years, they've had inflation above their target, and there's been pressure on the Bank of England to bring inflation down. At the same time, Britain has been in recession, so there's been pressure on the Cameron government to do fiscal stimulus. And yet those two policies would completely counteract each other. And so if you actually targeted nominal GDP, it would be more transparent that what you're doing with monetary policy is actually targeting aggregate demand. And that would leave fiscal policy for what it does best, which I would argue is not stabilizing the economy, but serving other needs of the country. So, I mean, think of it this way. If you're targeting nominal GDP at 5% with monetary policy, any change in the budget deficit is not going to affect nominal GDP growth. The Fed will just offset that with tighter monetary policy or easier monetary policy. So Congress can go ahead and do fiscal policy in the way that they think is appropriate for the long-run interests of the country without worrying about, oh, how is that going to affect the business cycle? Okay. And it would make that distinction clear. Now, it should be clear anyway, and it is clear to many economists, but in the public debate, I think that distinction gets lost sometimes. I believe in Congress the prevailing view may be uh, the Fed should sort of stand down and stop its activism, mm -hmm. and we ought to put focus on fiscal policy and, and do draconian things to get the deficit down. Would you comment on the wisdom of, of that? Well, I sort of half agree. I think it's desirable to get the deficit down, but I, if the Fed were to stand off when that happened, it could push us back into recession. So what I would rather is the Fed sort of target, say, nominal growth at, you know, whatever, say 5%, so that when the Fed, uh, when the Congress does that deficit reduction, it doesn't reduce aggregate demand and put us into a, a double-dip recession like we had in 1937 in the Great Depression. I believe I read something in one of your works that suggests that you believe that monetary policy is a lot more powerful than fiscal policy. Is that right? Yeah, I mean, I think if you think about that, in the economics profession, whenever we talk about, say, inflation targeting, 100% of the time it's discussed in terms of monetary policy, and 0% of the time it's discussed in terms of fiscal policy targeting inflation. Now, why do economists of both conservative and liberal persuasion believe that you, it only makes sense to talk about inflation targeting in terms of monetary policy? Because they just don't think fiscal policy is powerful enough to control the rate of inflation over the long run. And that suggests that they think monetary policy over time has more impact on inflation. Now, there is a, a special argument, of course, at the zero interest rate we haven't gotten into that. Um, uh, we market monetarists think monetary policy can still be highly effective even at a zero rate. Um, some people don't agree with that, and that's, of course, where one of the arguments for fiscal stimulus comes in. Let me uh, <clears throat> take that question and frame it in a different way. If the Fed had been following a nominal GDP target, credibly it was believed, then what happened in 2008, 2009, we believe, would, would have been avoided largely. There may have been some, you know, some downturn, but been much milder. Mm -hmm. Had that been the case, then you wouldn't have had a big call for fiscal policy. You wouldn't have had 
you know, the big deficit plans, even TARP, all, those, all of those programs, there simply wouldn't be an argument for them if nominal GDP targeting had kept in total spending on track. I mean, same thing if you go back to the early 1930s. Between 1929 and 1933, the U.S. dollar spending economy fell in half. The dollar size of the economy fell 50 percent. And, you know, we standard view and the view we take is the Fed didn't necessarily cause that, but they allowed it to go, the economy go over the cliff. Had the Fed been more active and had a nominal GDP target, it would have kept current dollar spending going, and it would have, you know, changed the debate about a lot of things in the 1930s, in the New Deal, fiscal policy. So the Fed's failures open doors for other policies to come into play. Yes. A couple questions, if I could. One is just mechanically how this would work with the Fed. Would they look? Would they base their what they want to target inflation on based on 12, uh, 12 months ahead? What they expect growth to be? Twenty four months? Would there be any trailing indicators? It would be forward-looking. I'll let Scott answer that because he has a specific idea. Well, my preference would be for the Fed to actually set up and, and subsidize trading in a nominal GDP futures market so that we have a market read on where nominal GDP is expected to go. Uh, I don't expect that to happen in the near future. So in the, in the absence of that, uh, I guess the best you could do is um, have the Fed researchers, and there's a lot of them there, uh, you know, work with their models, look at market indicators, and come up with their the best estimate of where they think nominal GDP growth would go under various policy settings. It's probably easiest to explain this when we're not at zero rates. So imagine we're at positive interest rates. So you could have a conditional forecast of nominal growth at one, two, three, four percent interest rates. And then once the staff prepares these uh, conditional forecasts, all the, the board has to do is say, oh, well, we want 5% nominal GDP growth, so we'll pick the interest rate that the board thinks is most likely to deliver that, uh, sorry, that the researchers think is most likely to. Um, now, at, at zero uh, rates, it becomes trickier. You might do uh, conditional forecast based on different, um, different amounts of QE. Um, larger amounts of QE would presumably lead to <laughs> higher nominal GDP growth forecasts. Um, but, you know, that gets into a lot of complexities with the, the level targeting we discussed earlier. Um, but essentially the idea, here's the metaphor I like, it's called targeting the forecast. And um, <laughs> the metaphor I like is if, if you imagine a captain is steering an ocean liner and you, you casually converse with him and and he says, well, we expect to end up in Boston um, in about two days. And you say, but aren't we headed to New York? And the captain says, well, we were, but given wind and current conditions, it was blowing us off course, and we now expect to make landfall in Boston. I would ask the captain, well, why haven't you adjusted the steering so that the port that you expect to end up in is the one that you want to end up, the goal, so to speak? And believe it or not, most central banks around the world are like that captain that is perfectly content to be blown off course. That is, most central banks will give you a forecast for economic growth in nominal terms that's different from where they'd like it to be. That raises the question, well, why don't they adjust policy until the forecast nominal growth in the economy is equal to the goal of nominal growth? You, you make those identical, essentially. It, it makes obvious sense if you're thinking about steering a ship, but and, it, and usually monetary policy does do roughly that, and certainly in your period of the Fed, I think it did work roughly that way. But at the zero bound, central banks become very cautious. They're not willing to do highly aggressive moves. So the central banks end up doing less than they actually expect would be needed to get the growth they want, and they sort of cross their fingers and hope that things go better than they actually expect on average. And at least that's my perspective. I do remember you, you try to get the money supply to grow a certain percentage over time and you'd overshoot it or undershoot it and you just go back to the desired percentage and there'd be no real thought to um, overdoing it one way or the other to make up for the past mistakes. Can, David, can I, could you put oh, the uh, equation yeah. exchange? Focusing on the bottom, where, on the right side, uh, where the P is the price level, and Y is real income. A couple of meetings ago, the FOMC formally adopted a price target of 2%. That's something Bernanke had been wanting to do for a long time, but they finally did it. 
So now they've got a 2% target for P, and they think that real income is growing too slowly because it's not growing fast enough to bring the unemployment rate down. Couldn't you, couldn't you say they've got an implicit target for Y of 3 or 4%, and if you put those two things together, in a way, isn't that nominal GDP targeting? It, 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 it does it component by component, but you can add them up and get, get what you're referring to as the nominal GDP. The target. biggest difference would be when you get into level targeting. If you go off course, we're much more off course on the nominal GDP track than on the price level track. So that's then the, where the rubber hits the road about what are they going to do in that situation. Seems like in the short run, you'd be indifferent between uh, 4% inflation and 1% growth or 2 and 3 or 3 and 2. You would be indifferent. <clears throat> Is that politically possible? I mean, if you've got a situation where you've got very low growth and very high inflation, uh, if the nominal GDP target is on track, you'd say stay the course, right? Mm -hmm. How do you fend off these guys' bosses? Uh, well, I, I think kind of going back to this gentleman's original question, part of implementing this is to clearly set expectations and to shift focus away from an inflation target and a real growth target, focus on one term. So, you know, how, how will you implement it? Well, part of it is a premise that we have, that the importance of expectations. If you can convince the public that their total you know, dollar incomes, firms, the to total dollar sales will be growing at, a, on average, a steady pace. I mean, they, the public effectively does the monetary policy. Um, like right now, I, I mentioned, I showed the slides that households are holding a, a large share of liquid assets. I mean, we want households to, to kind of lose some of that, that panic, that uncertainty, and switch into higher yielding, yet riskier assets, and that kind of helped with kickstart the economy, portfolio rebalancing. So just setting an explicit target itself, we want 5% growth, we want to return it to trend, would, would kind of catalyze the private sector. I mean, this, this policy actually minimizes the Fed's intervention in a sense in that it, it creates expectations for the private sector to, to, to do much of the adjustment. And with Scott's proposal for a, a futures target, even more so. I'd like to follow up on that question. I think a good example of something close to what you're talking about is actually 2008. We had an adverse supply shock with really soaring oil prices in the middle of the year. Growth slowed sharply and inflation rose. So it was probably not too far from those numbers of 1% real growth, 4% inflation. And in the second half of the year, when things started to turn down, uh, Dave and I think the Fed really was behind the curve in terms of easing. Uh, a real critical decision occurred in the meeting two days after Lehman Brothers failed. At that time, the Fed Fund's interest rate was 2%. This is in September 2008. And we now know that nominal GDP was already falling very rapidly at that time. The Fed had a meeting and decided not to cut rates two days after Lehman failed. Why not? They said in their statement, well, we see equal risks of recession and inflation. Well, it's clear why they saw a risk of recession, but what about the risk of inflation? They were essentially looking backwards. They were looking at the inflation over the last 12 months, which had been higher than they would have liked, because partly due to the surging oil prices. And they weren't looking forward. But if you looked at the bond market indicators of inflation expectations, what's called the TIPS spread, it was showing inflation expectations of only 1.2% over the next five years. That's actually below the Fed's target. So under a forward-looking um, procedure of sort of targeting the forecast, the Fed would have eased for two reasons, fear of recession and inflation actually be likely be below their target. But they were spooked by the high inflation, which was politically unpopular, into not doing more monetary stimulus. And as a result, we had a deeper than a necessary recession. I think you just have to roll with the punches. If the inflation is coming from a supply shock, like an oil price surge, you're going to get temporarily higher inflation and lower real growth. But it's better to ride that out. And generally, core inflation won't move very much in that situation. Uh, but if you try to stamp down on that uh, high inflation at a time the economy is already weak, you really risk uh, spiraling into a much deeper downturn. And that's, of course, what happened in late 2008. Now, you can say hindsight is 2020, but again, the, the markets 
This is where the term market monetarism comes in. The markets were indicating that the Fed was likely to undershoot their inflation targets substantially over the next five years. And guess what? It turned out the markets were right. I mentioned 1.2%. Inflation has actually been about 1.4 or 5% since mid-2008, the headline CPI. It's been below the Fed's 2% target. So the markets, they're not perfect in forecasting, but they were looking ahead, and the Fed, I think, was looking backwards at that point and, and, and simply was reacting too much to inflation from oil prices they couldn't do much about. Yeah. I, let me, I, let me I just... don't disagree with any of that, but ironically, people were yelling that the Fed was being too easy. I know. Right. Yeah. This, this figure here is, is the point Scott was making. It shows the expected average inflation rate over the next five years from the Treasury market, from the break-even inflation. And uh, you can see prior to Lehman, it was going down. Um, I have up there passive mild tighten. This, this, is, this is an idea that Scott and I share that the Fed doesn't have to consciously tighten policy for policy to tighten. By failing to act, it effectively does tighten. The bond market was screaming, we're headed over a cliff, we're headed over a cliff. Um, and they were lowering their forecast for inflation. Why do you lower your forecast for inflation? You think there's going to be a slowdown. You think things are going to get worse. And the Fed was effectively driving the car looking in the rearview mirror at the headline CPI and commodity prices last month. They weren't looking forward. The market was screaming, look forward, we're headed over a cliff. And the Fed effectively was looking in the rearview mirror. We've got another cliff coming at January 1st. What's, what are the implications of what the Fed ought to be doing about that, if any? Um, well, I would argue that one of the advantages of level targeting is that um, you know, we, we have the graph where you say go down and come back to the trend line or go up and come back to the trend line. But that also um, overlooks the fact that it makes those deviations smaller in the first place. And that's because a lot of recent research in economics suggests that current aggregate demand or current spending in the economy is strongly influenced by expectations of the future. So if during that period, say in late 2008, um, there was confidence that any decline would be offset and we'd come back to the trend line within a few years, investment would have held up better because firms would have had confidence that any downturn would be short-lived. But instead, firms correctly saw that it was going to be a, a deep and long-lasting recession, and so investment fell very, very sharply. It's sort of like the analogy I'd use is the way commodity markets work. The price of gold or oil or something like that today is very strongly influenced by what people think it'll be worth two or three years down the road. And the same is true of aggregate demand. If you have a policy to quickly return to the trend line, that will keep it from falling so sharply in the first place initially or rising too high because it, people out in the markets, firms, investors will expect the Fed to bring it back to that trend line. So I believe that with a fiscal cliff coming up, if we had a level targeting regime where we promised to make up for any shortfall, the effect of the fiscal cliff on real GDP would be much smaller than under current policy where there's no promise to make up for any shortfall caused by a, a fiscal cliff. Yes. Um, how does this work in extreme circumstances? Say you're targeting 5% in GDP. I think there was a 12-month period in 2008 where the economy contracted 5 or 6%, if I'm not mistaken. Do you want inflation at that point of 10 or 11%? And similarly, occasionally, growth will go above 5%. Do you want deflation at times like that, if that's forecast? It just won't happen. It, it, there's no macro model where you could get 5% fall in real GDP and 11% inflation from a, essentially a demand side problem, which is what the financial crisis was. I, I'm not saying it's impossible. Obviously, if there was a catastrophic supply side problem for the US economy, that could happen. Uh, but if it's something on the demand side, and, and the, ba the basic problem was demand in this recession, ask yourself, how could firms be raising prices 10% in such a weak economy? And we know wages are sticky. So wages are going to be chugging along at they're probably 3% at that time. So if firms were raising their price uh, 10%, profit margins would have been soaring in that condition, which, which is inconsistent with the assumption of real GDP falling. So the interesting thing about your example, though, is that sort of thought experiment, I think, helps people understand why real GDP would be more stable in the first place with nominal GDP targeting. It would be very unlikely to see that sort of pattern occur in the first place 
Again, unless it was a supply shock, and, and the Fed can't do anything about supply shocks, but uh, if it's something coming from the demand side of the economy, you're just not going to have plunging real output and soaring inflation at the same time. We just don't see that. Any other questions from the audience? Well, Bob, I'm going to bring up one other point okay. that we haven't touched on, and that's the, the idea that nominal GDP targeting would actually help savers. And one of the complaints you hear now is that the interest rates are really low, savers are being harmed, even you know, banks, financial firms have small profit margins because interest rate spreads are really, really low. And often the low rates are attributed to the Fed. It's all the Fed's fault. The Fed has pushed rates so low, it's, it's harming the economy. Um, the way we look at it is that the rates are low because the economy is in a slump. And the Fed may have done some small change on the margin, but most of the decline in interest rates has come from the economy being weak. And a nominal GDP target would change that. It would restore robust growth, and the demand for credit would go up. So imagine if, the, if everyone believed the economy was going to grow, if firms believed the economy was going to grow, they would start issuing more bonds, there would be more demand for credit, it increased the, uh, the price of credit interest rates. Uh, so we, we look at this differently. I mean, l let me show you a, a picture here that highlights this. This, this shows uh, the relationship between uh, the one-year forecast of nominal GDP. This comes from the professional uh, survey forecasters from Philadelphia Fed. You know, the relationship between a one-year head forecast of nominal GDP and interest rates is positively related. So if we expect higher growth, we would expect rates to go up. Rates are low primarily now because of the weak economy. Uh, one, other, one other thing I just wanted to, to note along these lines, this slide shows the share of marketable U.S. treasuries. So this doesn't include those treasuries held by the Social Security Fund, but th these are marketable treasuries, the treasuries that are being traded that help determine interest rates and yields on treasuries. Um, and, and the blue area shows treasuries held by the Fed, and the red measures all the, all the other parties that hold treasuries. So the other parties would be foreigners, households, pension funds, other intermediaries. And as you can see, most of the treasuries are held outside the Fed. Now, the Fed is the single largest holder. But what's striking about that figure, at least to me, is the biggest run-up in government debt we've seen ever and it was readily bought up by entities outside the Fed. So if you want to blame anyone for low rates, blame you and me and our banks and our pension funds. They're buying up the debt. And you know, the question is, why? Why are they doing that? Because they still see some uncertainty about the future. Um, and, and we believe a nominal GDP target would, would remove a lot of that uncertainty. It would, it would change expectations about the future. Um, right. Go no, go ahead. I, I uh, just... Right now, households still have a really low expectation. I mean, one other picture, I'll, I'll squeeze one, one more. I have. And this here shows a forecast of households. This comes from the uh, Michigan Survey of Consumer Sentiments. So we're all familiar with the Consumer Confidence Index that comes out every month. One of the questions they ask is, what is your dollar income growth going to be like over the next year? And you can see through most of this period, we call the Great Moderation, the early 80s of 2007, it was around 5%. And then it's declined and is yet to come up. So most households still don't see a, a return to normality in terms of their dollar income growth. A nominal GDP target would put us on that path and, and change interest rates. I, I wanted to give a few examples of you, your point about interest rates being misleading. Because, I mean, monetary policy is a very counterintuitive and confusing field. I would say the vast majority of people right now think monetary policy is very expansionary. But consider a few examples. Uh, in the late 90s, Milton Friedman said, uh, in terms of Japan, low interest rates are not easy money. It's a sign that money has been tight, or ultra low interest rates. At that time, Japan had seen its interest rates fall to roughly zero. And at the same time, Japan was experiencing deflation. Now ask yourself, if money was really that expansionary, why was there deflation in Japan? Then we have the example of the US in the Great Depression, the only other time in history where we've seen interest rates fall to zero, at least last 100 years. And what did we have? We had tremendous deflation. At the time, most people in America thought that money was very expansionary, and the Great Depression was happening despite this expansionary monetary policy, because the Fed had cut interest rates to very low levels, and they'd pumped money into the economy, what we would call QE. The Fed did that in the early 1930s. So most people thought money was expansionary. Today, most economists have accepted the revisionist view, started by Friedman and Schwartz, that 
Actually, money was very tight in the Great Depression relative to what was needed because there was so much hoarding of money. And I think at some point in the future, there'll be a revisionist take on this crisis as well, where the standard view, which is that money has been very expansionary, will be revised and people will start to say, you know, it hasn't really been as expansionary as was needed. And instead, those low interest rates were a sign of a weak economy, just as in Japan in the 90s, just as in America in the 1930s. They're a symptom. And if you look at all three examples, you see very low nominal GDP growth. If it were really true that zero interest rates were a sign of easy money, we ought to see countries with zero interest rates experience high inflation. But in fact, it's exactly the opposite. So that's a, a common misconception that I think makes it hard for people to recognize the true role of monetary policy in this crisis. I don't think it's a misconception that Bernanke has. Though. No, that's he right. Has, he's trying to get money growing faster, and it's being sort of blocked by the, by the holding of excess reserves of the banking system. Mm -hmm. uh, among your market indicators that uh, you use, you mentioned tips. Would you include gold in that? The price of gold? At one time I would have, but now um, the thing that concerns me about this slump is that not only gold but other commodities like oil have held up surprisingly well um, despite the weak economy in the Western world. And one theory is that Asian demand for commodities, including gold, believe it or not, not just oil and metals, has been so strong the commodity prices have been much higher than you'd expect. So if you think that gold is now an international indicator that reflects the rapid growth in the developing world, it may not be a reliable inflation indicator anymore. So my personal opinion, yeah, it has some role to play, but I'd put more weight on tip spreads. I don't know how you feel. Yeah, I, I share the same view. Uh, <clears throat> something else that, that, that's worth sharing is, you know, we, we showed this graph here of... Um, nominal GDP below trend. You know, I think both Scott and I are open to, to, the, to the notion that we don't have to return to the blue trend or the red trend. Just, just the, you know, the view that nominal GDP targeting is better than inflation targeting. I mean, you could start a whole new trend if you wanted to. It, it, it better stabilizes the economy. It avoids the booms, bust better, as Scott explained. Um, if, if you're someone who doesn't think the Fed, you know, has done that bad of a job, we still would think a, a, a a great case can be made for a, a new target, even if you start a new path. You don't return to the pre-crisis trend path. So nominal GDP targeting, uh, wherever we, we can have a debate where we want to start the new path, but we believe it's optimal. We're going to have to wrap up. Is there any one short point that either one of you feels compelled to squeeze in? Well, I, I would note that Scott and I have some articles we've written if you want more. Um, and you, you have. And the book. And there's a, yeah, there's a book yeah. I've written, so buy plenty of those. Um, and uh, just talk to the Institute about the articles we've published, too. Okay, and they both have uh, good websites. Uh, Marginal Revolution is, is one, and the other no, one. That they endorsed. Uh, oh, that that's right? not the name. Okay. That's Tyler's. That's Tyler's. What, what, what are your websites? Uh, I'm a macro and other market musings. Um, mine is called themoneyillusion.com. Okay, thank you so much for coming. Let me just say one last thing. We did hand out packets, but with so many people, if you did not get a packet, see me or our men out there. We'll get your name and address and make sure that you get all the information, which has the paper that Scott talked about and all the contact information. Thanks. <laughs>